Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars on a beautiful Florida Friday morning with temperatures in the mid 50s. There's no humidity. It's just absolutely perfect. And this, this is what we've waited all year for. I mean, this kind of weather. This is why people who live down here full time, because they obviously don't have the funds to be winter residents, uh, end up, you know, loving Florida in the winter time because this is it. This is the weather that we all wait for. And uh, I'm just absolutely enjoying it. So far, it's been great this season. We have not been cheated out of cold weather or cool weather. The mornings are not. Nice. The middle of the day is, yeah, it's fine. Uh, the evenings are good, and so far, so good. It's been very, very proper, and uh, I have no complaints at all. And again, I'd be a real jerk if I found everything to complain. Of. This is the weather I'm waiting. This is the good stuff, you know, so I'm not going to pretend that it's not. And these guys who live down here, and they, oh, it's cold today. Man, I want to beat them to death. You know, how dare, after July, in August to even pretend that it's uncomfortably cold. I could run out here absolutely naked and love it because it's just perfect. This is the way that anyway, look, I'm rambling on. I'm not going to do that. But needless to say, this is good weather and uh, anybody who says otherwise is an absolute idiot. An idiot. And uh, God knows there's plenty of those guys running around. Um, I'll get into this really quick. Uh, real quick news. So my snowflake nephew is home for the holidays. You know, he's off college. Um, and I have him working down at the shop, which is a mixed bag. Because for the most part, he actually has a pretty good attitude. And he doesn't mind a little bit of hard work. You know, like I had him prep this car, for instance. And uh, he did it without complaint. Uh, but for the most part, it's just an educational session. Like, I have him watching movies most of the time. Uh, we've gone through a few. I made him watch Beverly Hills Cop. He'd never seen it. He had no idea. I also made him watch Eddie Murphy's Delirious, by the way, which he found very, you know, triggering. But he... <laughs> He watched it anyway, God bless him. Uh, we watched Fast Times at Ridgemont High, we had Talladega Nights, 48 hours, and then yesterday, Ford versus Ferrari, which is, you know, pretty new movie. Uh, he was pissed off because at the end, uh, Ken Miles, played by, um, what's his name, Christian Bale, you know, died in a fiery crash, and you know, they oh, he couldn't get out of the car. Well, in fact, Ken Miles was ejected from the car when it crashed and how he really died and somehow that triggered my nephew. It wasn't accurate enough for him, but he didn't like the movie. And uh, it tells me there is some hope for, uh, at least for him. I'm not sure there's hope for his generation, but at least there's hope for him. And um, anyway, look, we'll just keep going. So this is a 69 Camaro Sport Coupe. Uh, you'll have to forgive me if this review is a little bit rambling because I'm loaded up in coronavirus whiskey. Uh, corona is all of a sudden back. All of my family, at least my sister and her family, are all tied up with corona. It's so 2020. I can't believe it's still going on. Uh, but it is, and I've taken the opportunity to... Uh, and just a pretty fair amount of Basil Hayden whiskey to make sure that I don't get the coronavirus, uh, even if I don't think I care if I do, but um, I certainly do enjoy the whiskey. So uh, we'll carry forward with this review, but you know, give me a little bit of leeway. Um, for, and for the record, I can't nearly get to everything on this car. I mean, forget it. I could do five 40 minute videos on a 69 Camaro and still not cover everything about them or all the stuff that people think they should hear. Uh, so in this video, I'm just gonna hit a few of the things that interested me about the car, and I know it's gonna be, you know, 40 minutes-ish, and uh, you know, if I'm missing things that you think should be in there, well, fine, it could be in one of the other five 40-minute videos about it, but um, I just don't have the time to do it. Uh, first of all, 1969 was a pretty big year in the United States. 
You call it a seminal year, call it what you want. Uh, there was the moon landing. I mean, you really don't get much bigger in the news department than that. America actually put a man on the moon. Now, I know there's people who say that didn't happen, and I think they should be beaten to death, but that's not, you know, for me to really say. Just an opinion, but um, it. Uh, I remember Buzz, Buzz Aldrin, you know, beat up some guy who said that, and, and I agree with him. But either way, that was what happened in 69. That was the big news of the year. Neil Armstrong, small step for man, all that stuff. Uh, very, very big deal. Very cool. Uh, in 69, you also had Woodstock, which, of course, was... Um, yeah, it was important to the boomers, you know, it was their music concert, the brown acid, whatever it is that they were going on about. Uh, obviously, it meant something to them, even if I think it's pretty silly. Uh, you also had Chappaquiddick, that was Ted Kennedy, he drowned that woman, yeah, well, obviously not. Probably not intentionally. He just drove his car into the uh, river and, and she ended up drowning. And then I think he ended up trying to blame his cousin or something. And uh, somehow it all worked out for him. He ended up keeping his job as a senator. And uh, everybody loved the Kennedys at that time. But Chappaquiddick was going on then. Uh, you had Charles Manson. Uh, you know, his followers, those weird fuckers, they ended up killing people. Um, not Sharon Stone, Sharon something. And uh, that was a very big news item at the time. Uh, you had Midnight Cowboy in the theaters, if you remember that. You had the Love Bug, uh, Herbie, that was his debut. Uh, you had Jimi Hendrix, you had... You know, it was that time. 69 was a pretty big year. Uh, a house in 69, a new house averaged about 15 grand. And the salary that you got was about eight grand. So this is the kind of thing that made sense, very much unlike today. Uh, Tie-dyes, bell-bottoms, the Sesame Street debuted. Uh, Nixon became president. Uh, he had some troop withdrawals in Vietnam. The Beatles, they had Abbey Road. Uh, ARPANET, the precursor to the internet. In 69, it was the first time that data got moved around in that. So all in all, 69 was a pretty seminal year, uh, not just for Camaros, but also for the world at large. And we'll get into the Camaro part. And here it is, look, every once in a while, something all comes together just right. I mean, just absolutely perfect. Um, and I'm speaking not just in the car department, but in all of life. I mean, the music of Mozart, you know, it just came together perfectly. The Declaration of Independence, uh, a beautiful, beautiful document. To me, as beautiful as the Mona Lisa, except in document form. Uh, Farrah Fawcett, absolutely gorgeous in the late 70s. The 85 Chicago Bears, you know. I know the Dolphins were undefeated, but there's no question the 85 Bears were a better team. Uh, and they were absolutely perfect. The Statue of Liberty, and you can add into that the 1969 Chevy Camaro. I mean, things came together making an end product better than the sum of its parts, and they end up creating a legend that gets passed down from generations, from one generation to the next. I mean, even my nephew's snowflake generation, probably a fair bulk of them are going to end up appreciating the 69 Camaro, and, uh, and frankly, they should. Um, it's far from the only car to achieve that hollowed ground, by the way, but it's probably the most fun uh, out of any of them. I mean, looking at it, sitting in it, driving it, uh, it all just feels right. I mean, the car just suits its mission perfectly. And the mission, of course, was to take on uh, Ford's pony car Mustang, which had come out in 64, uh, to incredible hype and success. Uh, but the hype was absolute. I mean, this was the 60s with the whole ad agency thing going on, the whole... 
I don't know. It was kind of like the beginning of the modern era, at least in terms of PR and that sort of thing. And uh, the Mustang had come out. GM had nothing to answer it with. They initially thought that the Corvair could pull off that duty, uh, but it just didn't have the engine choices or the option list to do so. And then Ralph Nader's Unsafe at Any Speed came out in 1965, and uh, that didn't help things at all. So uh, Chevy was in trouble, and the team that had designed the Corvair was given the task of creating a car that could compete with the Mustang. And it was led by a guy named Henry Haga. I think I'm pronouncing that right, but who knows. But uh, his team had also designed the Chevy 2 Supernova show car, and more importantly, they did the redesign for the 68 Vet. So they were a pretty, pretty cool team, and uh, they were alleged to be all car guys, enthusiasts, that sort of thing. And uh, they were given the task of creating this thing that would compete with the Mustang, which was just absolutely setting the world on fire. Uh, but attaining this perfection wouldn't be easy. I mean, uh, for cost purposes, the design would have to be based on the dimensions of the existing Chevy 2 platform. You know, it became the F-Body, which was different, but it still had to be based on the Chevy 2, which was a volume seller, very important car for Chevrolet, uh, and it, it would, how would I put this, it would, it would be important enough to make sure that the Camaro had to fall within the dimensions of the Chevy 2. So they couldn't they couldn't do everything they wanted with the Camaro because again it had to be based on this basically the way the Ford uh, based the Mustang on the Falcon, which was of course going to be a huge seller. Um, Chevy based it on the Chevy 2 and they had to keep the dimensions the same so that put the cow height a little higher than they wanted it to be um, the front axle was further back than they wanted they called it the dashboard to axle measurement you can see there if you look on the side uh, there's the dash there's the axle they wanted to push it further up front but they couldn't because they had to fit it within the Chevy 2 guidelines and of course the height as well uh, the next-gen Camaro, which came out in 1970, um, that was much more free for those. You know, they they had a much more carte blanche ability to make a car. Uh, with this car, they had to fit it into a system that they didn't necessarily want to, but they made the best of it. And at the end of the day, they knocked it out of the park. And you have to give them credit for that. Uh, but another thing that came, they squashed the fastback. I mean, the guys who designed it wanted to make a fastback that would compete with the Ford Mustang because, of course, that had coupe, convertible, and fastback form. Uh, with the Camaro, they were told coupe and convertible only, no fastback, and that kind of made them sad. But what they came up with worked. Uh, it had this long front end, sort of a Coke bottle design, which isn't immediately obvious, but it is if you look at it. Uh, uh, you know, that it fit in with their design of the 68 Corvette. Um, a very short rear deck and uh, a very clean greenhouse, even if it was a little bit taller and more formal than they wanted. Uh, they ended up making it all work, and it worked very, very well. Uh, they rushed it to production. They called it the F-Body, and it came out, you know, two years after the Mustang, even more than two years. But... Even if it was a little bit of a day late, it was not a dollar short. Uh, a few different names were considered for the car. Uh, they were going to call it the Chaparral. That was one of the names. Uh, the Nova, because of course it was the Chevy 2 at the time. The Nova would come out a little bit later and be a different car. Uh, the Panther, which is what it was developed as. Um, you know, it was the F body. It was uh, I can't X three eighty six or I can't remember exactly, but the Panther was one of the original names. Uh, G Mini, which sounds like some kind of modern rapper. I can't believe that was a name that was considered, but apparently it was a thing at the time. The Wildcat, which wouldn't make any sense because that was wrapped up with Buick and the Gemini. Uh, but somehow in the end, they found the name Camaro. Uh, legend has it that. Uh, the head of Chevy, Pete Estes, very cool car guy, uh, read it in an old French dictionary. Uh, it was some sort of slang word for comrade, friend, 
you know, which is what a Camaro shit is absolute horseshit. I mean, some PR guy in Chevy decided to name it the Camaro or came up with the name Camaro to sort of match the C word names that were going on with Chevy at the time, like Chevelle and Corvette and Chevy two and uh, that sort of thing. And he must have just somehow come up with Camaro. And it worked, it, you know, it worked perfectly. Uh, product managers were instructed to tell the press that the Camaro was a small, vicious animal that eats Mustangs. And, uh, you know, that became a thing of legend. Uh, so the car was released to a lot of hype. It had a big, ridiculous um, debut, you know, with the press, with all the sort of subtle, hinting, weird stuff, uh, you know, the, association for the end of Panther. I, look, it, it, you have to look into it, but it, it, it went through a lot of crap. And it ended up getting released. They had a huge radio and TV campaign, uh, you know, to match the hype that was around the Mustang. There was a feature-length movie and even an off-Broadway play as part of the whole PR campaign around the Camaro. And, um, you know, it had a lot to live up to, this car. Had a lot of hype around it. And amazingly, it actually lived up to the task. Uh, but perfection would only be attained in 1969. I know there's going to be people who would very vehemently, vehemently disagree with me that the 67, 68 Camaros were just fine. And I think they were. But I think the design in 69 was what absolutely brought it all together and turned this car into an icon. Uh, the body changed just enough to make it more of a muscle car than a pony car. Uh, right in the year that muscle cars, well, it was peak muscle car, 1969. I mean, that was it. After that, it sort of all started uh, declining. But 1969, uh, you could argue was absolute peak muscle car. And uh, they made it a little bit lower, a little bit wider. It was more angular at the front. They gave these trapezoidal wheel arches. The uh, 67, 68s were not. They were much more round. Um, it was called the hugger because it was supposed to hug the pavement, hug the ground. There was a hugger orange color that came out. Um, but whatever you want to call it, it was a big deal, the 69 design. And it wasn't just all the stuff I just mentioned, the angular front, the trapezoidal arches. It was these beautiful body lines which came off the front and rear fenders and swept towards the back and made the car look like it was going at a shockingly fast rate of speed even when it was standing still. And I think that's the key design feature on the 69 Camaro that makes it so iconic. You can see the bulbous fenders, uh, muscular and at the same time square. It just became more than the sum of its parts. Uh, it, it, it just looks fast, even when it's sitting there kind of stationary. And the 69 design achieved this iconic status. I mean, it puts it up there with like the 32 Ford Hot Rod, the 57 Chevy, the 59 Cadillac Eldorado, and uh, even the VW Beetle. It just became one of the iconic car. And you know, the whole first gen Camaro thing was a little bit rushed. I mean, it was sort of a gap filler until they could come out with the design that they really wanted, which was the second generation F-Body. Uh, this first gen was sort of hurried together, rushed together to become uh, a, a Mustang competitor. And then in 69, they nailed it. And it would become what people consider to be the best looking Camaro design of all time. Uh, in fact, when they came out with the Camaro again in 2009, uh, many years later after it had gone away, I think it went away in 02, um, they brought it back in 09. And it was a retro design meant to look like the 69 Camaro. So it just became one of the most important designs in car history. And it's recognized that way today. And uh, it's one of those cars that sort of, you know, like I have a 50 Lincoln, which is absolutely gorgeous, beautiful car, but nobody alive today recognizes it or cares about it. 69 Camaros, even kids love it today because it's one of those designs that got passed on. It's just absolutely iconic. And another thing that Chevy pulled off, by the way, 
uh, was the options list, which was one of the reasons they couldn't go with the Corvair. Uh, the Mustang had a very big option list, and it could be ordered in a variety of different ways from, you know, a little kind of pussified car into a very muscle car. And the Chevy was absolutely the same. There was a limitless combination of colors, equipment, uh, engines, transmissions, rear ends. Uh, the Camaro could be a car for absolutely anyone. Uh, you could get a coupe, uh, convertible, an RS package, an SS package, a Z28 package, uh, or any combination of the three. There were luxury options like AC, power steering and brakes, AM FM stereo. There was even a light monitoring system like in a Cadillac and more and many, many more. I mean, loads and loads of available options. And there were weird options like liquid tire chains, uh, which were these kind of coffee can looking canisters in the back. You could press a button and it would spray down the rear tires with some kind of chemical that would make it a little bit grippier in the snow. Uh, it's just absolutely insane. Over three years, there were more than a dozen engine options, several different manual or automatic transmissions, 10 or 12 bolt rear ends, rear disc brakes. Um, it was a car that could be ordered with a, as a six cylinder convertible for a you know, hot young housewife to drive to the grocery store, all the way to a capo ordered stripped down version with a $4,000 aluminum big lock for drag racing. I mean, um, the car was extremely versatile. And frankly, that's one reason that I kind of like this example um, for its purity. I mean, there's it's a miracle it hasn't been made into a fake SS or Z28 or Yanko or Capo or, you know, over the years people buy these things and they just put the options on them that, that were the holy grail Camaros, even though the bulk of 69 Camaros were probably very much like this one. These are the ones that sat on the dealer's lots. You go to Meekum now and every Camaro looks like one of the few holy grail cars. The Yankos, the Capos, the RSSS, the RSZ28, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, to see one that's still allowed to be in its base coupe, sport coupe form, um, I think it's pretty cool and it makes me happy. So I tell you what, I'm going to pause there for a minute. I'm going to get my crap together. Uh, while we were talking, my nephew beat Dan, so I got to see what he's got going on. And then we're going to get into this particular car, which, uh, by the way, is going to be sold on Bring a Trailer and uh, I think is absolutely beautiful. So uh, bear with me one moment. All right, so look, let's have a look at this particular car. And again, the topic of 69 Camaros, you could just go on and on and on, and I could fill up five videos with stuff. So yeah, I know I missed a lot, but uh, it was just a very quick history in the design and how it came to be and what its purpose was and uh, that um, that's going to be have to, it's going to have to be where we're at. So let's go over this car real quick and have a look. Uh, again, the Fathom Green I think is absolutely beautiful. Uh, you can see again in '69 the design they gave it this angular grill, um, a sort of a box shaped, the big round headlamps, uh, pointy bumper. You've got those marker lamps underneath. Looks terrific. You look at it from the front. It's wide. It's muscular. And uh, of course, that's how this car became a muscle car in 69 uh, instead of a pony car. At least, you know, in my opinion, and frankly, the opinion of many others like it. Uh, you see the 327 badging, the Camaro script on the back. Uh, obviously, that would all be different if it was an RS or SS or Z28. There were just so many different options and so many different styles this car could be done up in. Uh, I believe that probably this base coupe would have come with uh, hubcaps, which are not bad looking, but the rally wheels, I think, are a tremendously good upgrade for it and uh, and look great, as do the BF Goodrich uh, white letter tires. Uh, you see the trim running along the rocker panel looks nice. Uh, those body lines that swoop off the front and rear, absolutely gorgeous. Very, very subtle Coke body styling. Uh, beautiful greenhouse in this car. You see I've got the windows rolled down. Uh, so 
it's that, um, you know, hard top coupe look of the 60s, which of course wasn't great for rollover protection, but just, you know, keep the thing shiny side up and you'll be fine. Uh, there you see it's got some sort of swoopy vent looking thing at the back, which, you know, mimic what could be brake cooling ducts, but of course aren't. Um, push button, door handles, locks, which look nice. Chrome trim around the windows and the drip rails look good. They uh, widened and minimized the tail lights for 69. Uh, if it was the, um, another package would have had reverse lights down. Anyway, look, you could go on and on. Uh, but um, I think the thing looks terrific. Twice pipes there, nice little chrome bumper again. Bumper laws weren't a thing in 69 and it was more about beauty than anything else and that works. In 68 they got their side marker lights, that became a law. You can see that little one there at the back right in front of the bumper, little one right there in front of the 327 emblem. Uh, again, front discs, you could get rear discs, but it was a $500 option, which was very expensive at the time, and uh, almost nobody did it. So, let's have a look under the hood. And of course, under the, oh, in fact, I don't need a brake release inside, it's all up front. We've got a little catch lever inside here. Oh, we have to push that, keep it held. Oh, sorry about this. I'll get it. Ugh, and there, up it comes. All right, and this one has a 327, uh, which again, I understand is not the original engine for the car, but it is the original engine was a 327, and this one is period correct, and it looks great. It's, you know, as it came with the orange valve covers, the Chevy orange paint, the black air cleaner with the badge in the 327 turbo fire, uh, I don't think it had 300 horsepower, uh, even as a three, I think it had 225, but uh, either way, uh, two barrel, not sure what's on this one, still seems to be a two barrel, but I'll double check. Still has the uh, cast iron exhaust manifolds. And it all looks very, very original and proper under the hood. But, you know, as it again was the point and why they didn't compete using the Corvair, which of course had an air-cooled engine, uh, in this setup, in this F-body chassis that of course was borrowed from the Nova, they could run a wide variety of engines. And so they did. Uh, the base engine, uh, was a 230 cubic inch six cylinder and inline six, which actually the rarest Camaro of all is apparently an inline six convertible. They only made like 1,700 of them. There are 20,000 Z28s in 69, but only 1,700 six cylinder convertibles. Uh, you could also get a 283 inline six. Uh, there was a 302. That was the Z28 motor with the solid lifters and, you know, big compression meant for SECA racing. Uh, this 327 later in the 69 model year was replaced with a 307. Uh, the SS cars started at a 350 cubic inch. Uh, they moved on from there. There was a 396 cubic inch. Uh, big block which you could get in the car and that was the end of sort of the basic ordering if you got into this capo thing which I covered that in another car which I'll link to in the description uh, it was basically how you ordered fleet cars like taxi cabs and police cars uh, but they put in some hidden shit where a guy could go in and order a 427 uh, which otherwise they reserved for the Corvette, but with a special order, you could get a 427. Uh, a guy named Yenko, who had a series of dealerships and now has some famous Camaros, made a bunch of alum or iron block 427 Yenko cars, which are now ultra collectible and world famous. You could also, for $4,000, which cost more than the base coupe, the price alone, the engine option was $4,000. Get an aluminum 427 uh, LS7 big block, uh, which would 
a, a dominate drag racing and become, you know, they actually didn't sell that many. And how could they? Would the car cost such an insane amount of money? But that is now really the holy grail Camaro. And those cars do up in the, uh, the six and seven figure range. So they're very, very impressive. Uh, up front, you had, um, you know, these control arms and coil springs, shocks. In the rear, you had leaf springs. Uh, most of them had four wheel drums. You could get uh, front discs and um, even rear discs, although again, a very rare option. Um, you know, the different transmissions, three-speed manuals, four-speed manuals, Muncie's. Uh, this one has a two-speed automatic power glide, which, you know, they had. Uh, you could get that in any one of the three years, although not with the SS or RS. Uh, but a pretty cool transmission. And, uh, of course, uh, Turbo Hydra 350. And in the bigger big box, a Turbo Hydra 400. So um, it was just an endless supply of different options and packages and other things you could get under the hoods of these cars. And um, it worked very, very well for them. They actually never overtook the Mustang in terms of sales this early. That took all the way until 1977 uh, for the Camaro to overcome the Mustang. Uh, but um, they ate into them enough to make Chevy happy. And look, we never even talked about Pontiac and the Firebird. Um, a guy named um, John DeLorean was given the Firebird, the F-body uh, that this Camaro is based on as sort of a consolation prize because they wouldn't give him the Corvette that he wanted. Uh, they reserved that for Chevy. So they said, look, we're not giving you a Corvette. You can't make the Banshee, uh, which they had made some um, uh, concept cars out of. But we will give you the F-Body and you can have a Firebird. And that's a whole different 40 plus minute series of videos to get into the Firebirds, which we're not going to do, but um, but it would be ridiculous to talk about this car without even mentioning it. So at the same time, Pontiac had their own version of this car uh, that also sold very well and ate into the Mustang's dominance. So uh, I'm going to pause there for a minute. We're going to hop inside, have a look around the interior. I don't know if I opened the trunk, so let me do that. Let me do that. I think we jumped right under the hood. I miss the whole trunk part of it. Uh, to do that, we're going to put the key in here, give it a twist, pop it open, and there you go. Had a nice big trunk area. There you can see it has a full-size spare tire. Uh, a smaller spare tire was an option. Um, you're going to be able to fit lots of crap back here without any issue. It's just a nice, you know, this car, this F body reminds me more of the Fox body Mustang uh, than the Camaro Firebirds that were around at the time. It's more of a, you know, upright seating position sedan type thing than the F bodies that followed, which were sort of based on a Italian Ferrari design where it became much lower to the ground uh, with a bubble back and kind of a small trunk. Um, this one is much more practical and uh, you fit all kinds of toddlers, kids, weapons, guns, drugs, knives, whatever you want back there. Uh, a pretty good sized trunk. So uh, anyway, I'm going to pause it there for a minute and um, then we're going to hop inside and go for a spin. So bear with me. All right, so let's have a look inside this thing. Now, again, the fathom green outside, I think, matches this dark midnight green interior just absolutely beautifully. Perfect combination, uh, even if it's not the original for the car. Uh, fathom green is my color, so you're going to get no complaints from me. Uh, you look in the back seat, your Canadians are going to be pretty chipper back there. You got pretty good leg room, you got room for three, um, you know, you got windows that go down, you got a package shelf, everything looking nice, you got seat belts, uh, which I guess you didn't have to have back then, maybe it did, but either way, it looks pretty good, and, uh, you know, it's all going to work out well. Now, I don't know if your Camaro driver types were going to Woodstock in 69. Maybe it was more of a Rolling Stones concert or something, but uh, either way, you'd be back there smoking joints, being happy, you got your own little... Uh, there's a courtesy light. You got your own little ashtray, and uh, everyone's going to be pretty happy. Nice looking scuff plate with the body by Fisher. You got uh, retractable seat belts on the 
outside, although the interiors are not retractable, and well, we'll get into it when we sit in it. Uh, door panels looking nice and proper. You got some armrests there with padding. You got your door handle. You got your window cranks. You got your Camaro badge. Uh, the carpet looks absolutely lovely. Nice little pad. Uh, down below, you got disc brake logo on the um, on the brake pedal, your e-brake, your brake release, your gas pedal. Uh, nice looking steering column with a matching thin steering wheel that's lovely. And we'll sit inside and have a look. Uh, in 69, they went to these square gauges. They had been round before. Well, it's round inside, but uh, the cluster itself has square gauges. Uh, you see the Astro Ventilation. Uh, there. That came out in 68. In 67, these cars had vent windows. In 68, they went to this Astro Ventilation, which even with the windows up, will move air through the car that it's inducting from the front and then letting out the back. And that did away, they said, with the need for the vent windows and the sides of these cars became much cleaner. Uh, you got your headlight switch down there, you got your wipers, you got a series of warning lights on this side, series of warning lights on that side. Uh, you got a clock in the middle, which um, is still working miraculously. Uh, there's your climate control, no AC in this one, just a variety of ways to steer the air in the heat. Uh, it has an upgraded radio. This car meant to look it is original radio, but it's been upgraded, I believe, to have an auxiliary input, although don't hold me to it. Uh, but um, it's nice, and when you tune it, it works almost like the Wonder Bar, where it just automatically goes to the next station. Uh, it is very nice that this has the center console. Didn't have to. Could have had a column shifter, particularly with the power glide. Love this loopy um, you know, shifter mechanism <laughs> just looks cool with the wood trim and the chrome. And uh, there's the seatbelt receptacles that I'm talking about, uh, made to uh, clip in there and look neat and proper whether you use them or not. Pop that open, you got a nice little place to put a 38 caliber revolver, you know, a higher rate patrolman, whatever you would have got in 1969. But we'll leave that like that, push that back in. I can't get it to go down now. Oh, come on. Why am I doing this wrong? Oh, I'm reversed. I'll flip that over. And there it goes down, and they fit neatly into place. Uh, over here, you've got an ashtray, which looks nice. It's got a plug in it. Obviously, no one's smoking in this thing, which is a shame, because that's what it was built for. you got a glove box over here with the original owner's manual. Place to put a couple of cans of Coke. Uh, up here, you've got... Um, Center view mirror, nice, fits nice. You got some sun visors, lovely little chrome mounts for them. They work well, and uh, I'm sure a replacement headliner, although done perfectly in the factory style. And uh, there are some shoulder belts for the front occupants, which tuck up there nicely. There was also a very rare option, which gave the rear passenger so a shoulder yeah, belts, but yeah, very few cars were equipped like that because nobody gave a shit in the 60s about safety. And uh, down low, you've got more vent control. So, anyway, let's fire this thing up. And we'll go for a spin. So, there's a lovely little grumble growl out of that 327 V8. I mean, you know, there's just, one of the truest things in the world is the small block Chevy in an F body. It's just, it's just magical. So it's a unibody design at the back into a front subframe, sort of a mix of traditional um, you know, body on frame and unibody, and that's what the F-body was. Um, leaf springs in the back and, you know, nice um, independent suspension up front that works well. And, yeah, it's just all very F-body. So, to, look, shift this thing, you pick up on that, you see the lever there, go back into drive, and you are good to go. Uh, you got a nice vista over the hood, you've got that cool kind of center line, you've got two sort of power swoops on either side. Uh, you've got what I won't call knife edge fenders, but they do go up 
uh, on the left and the right, which gives you a lovely vista out the hood. And um, you can see that this was the design team that would have done the Corvette. It's got some similarities, despite being much more boxy than swoopy. Uh, the power steering works great, nice feature in this car. And away we go. So yeah, again, this wasn't the super high performance model, but at least it's the V8. So you get plenty of torque, plenty of horsepower, goes down the road nice. I cannot believe. Now I know this car has been restored and they did subframe mounts and motor mounts and probably, you know, new suspension, steering, brakes, all that stuff. But I really hadn't driven a restored 69 before, uh, taking this one home yesterday. And I was amazed at just how, I won't say it felt modern, but it felt like you could exist in the modern world with it. I could daily drive this car with no problem at all. There's no shake in the steering wheel. It goes down the road yeah, really perfectly right where you track it. Um, a lovely feel from the steering wheel, very powerful feel from the braking, uh, everything working just as it should. And I think that's another one of those reasons that the 69 Camaro became more than the sum of its parts. I mean, it just drives really, really nice. The signals work, you see the fuel gauge. Hopefully this Honda guy doesn't do something stupid. I mean, you can see why this car has been such a benchmark of the collector car world, and honestly, why it's going to continue to be so. Um, it's just such a nice car to drive. And because there were so many options, you have basically a limitless, limitless way to set this car up where it's going to still be correct. And that's even before you get into rest only. Look, we got the Sons of Anarchy here on the right. Oh, don't get a red light. They're gonna carjack me and run a train on my lady. Anyway, um, you could set this car up basically any way you want. I mean, there are resto mods out there with modern engines, modern braking, modern suspension. You can make them out to handle current supercars. You can do whatever the hell you want with this thing. And uh, you go from all original base to wild and crazy resto mod insanity. And all of it is beloved and accepted by the car world. So I think it's a big part of what makes the uh, 69 Camaro so beloved. Anyway, there it is. I'm going to stop there because I know this video is long. Uh, Auto House had some cool stuff coming up. I'm going to try to get one of those going for next week. I think they had a Chevelle. And uh, otherwise, um, really appreciate you guys having a look. This car is going to be on Bring a Trailer. Uh, hopefully, you know, the guy, yeah, we'll see. We're going to try. It's going to go up there, and uh, if you have an interest in it, keep an eye out. It'll be up in a few weeks. Thank you very much for having a look. Really appreciate it. We will see you with the next one. Take care.